Four years ago, I built an airtight greenhouse and I sealed myself inside with a bunch of plants in order to explain and demonstrate how we interact with the air we breathe and how we're causing climate change. That story went viral and it sort of took over my life. I kept getting asked the same question, which was what should we actually do to stop climate change? And while I had answers to that, they all felt woefully out of proportion to the scale of the crisis. And eventually that question started keeping me up at night. By 2020, I was working full time on climate change and I started planning a documentary to answer that question. But the pandemic put that project on hold and my stress over climate change took a toll on my body to the point where I actually needed surgery. So. After several years, I feel like I'm finally able to answer that question. And I also feel like I've learned to cope with the crisis without it eating away at me on the inside, literally. Now, in order for the answer to make sense, you need to have a good understanding of the science and the scope of this problem. So without further ado, let's jump back to the year 1856, when a scientist named Eunice Newton Foote discovered that jars filled with carbon dioxide got hotter than jars of regular air when both of them were exposed to sunlight. And from that, she rightly concluded that, quote, an atmosphere of that gas would give to our Earth a high temperature. We now call this the greenhouse effect. Sunlight passes through the Earth's atmosphere, bounces off the Earth at a different wavelength that excites greenhouse gases like these, and transfers heat energy to them and thus warms our atmosphere. Even though these greenhouse gases make up less than 0.1% of the stuff in our air, they are what keeps our planet from becoming a frozen wasteland. It's a very finely balanced natural process. However, by adding more CO2 to the air, even on the scale of parts per million, we're throwing off that balance and rapidly heating the planet to a deadly degree. We extract and burn an Olympic swimming pool worth of oil every four minutes of every day. In doing so, we're emitting CO2 faster than plants and algae can absorb it, causing CO2 levels to rise. We know that this is our fault because the CO2 increase is in direct proportion to the amount of fossil fuels that we've burned and to the land use changes like methane emitting landfills. We also know this because the additional CO2 in the atmosphere has the isotopic signature that we'd expect to see from human sources. We know how much CO2 was in the atmosphere and how warm Earth was in the past because we can sample it from air bubbles trapped in ancient ice. And we can also look at the fossils of different ancient species and see where they were living we can study tree rings, and we can look at human weather and atmospheric records. Scientists have been studying this for a really long time, and they are very sure that we are causing CO2 levels to rise faster than they have in 800,000 years. And in doing so, we're making the planet hotter. Since the Industrial Revolution, we've increased the amount of carbon dioxide in the air from 280 parts per million to 420 parts per million. Not everyone is equally at fault for this. In fact, most of the blame falls on the rich. Rich countries like these are responsible for half of all historical emissions, despite having only 12% of the world's population. At the national level too, the richest 10% of a country produces five to 13 times more carbon dioxide than the bottom 50%, depending on the country. All these emissions mean that we've already increased Earth's temperature by 1.19 degrees Celsius. We're on track for four degrees of warming by the end of the century, but it could be as high as six degrees. Now to put that into context, back during the last ice age, when there was an ice sheet three kilometers deep across Canada, the average global temperature was only five degrees colder than it is today. Viewed another way, there have been five mass extinctions so far in the history of the planet. Three of them were caused by a rapid rise or drop in CO2, which led to 
global warming or cooling, respectively. Each of them wiped out between 80 and 90% of life on the planet. And climate change isn't a lone environmental crisis. It's happening in the context of ecosystem collapse caused by habitat loss and other forms of pollution. All of this together means that we are likely at the start of the sixth mass extinction event. We are heading in the wrong direction and we are accelerating. In part, that's because we're still continuing to use more fossil fuels each year and in part, that's because of feedback effects. For example, as global warming melts Arctic permafrost, the methane that was trapped there gets released. And since it's a potent greenhouse gas, we get more global warming. As the climate warms, more water from the oceans evaporates into water vapor in the atmosphere. And that water vapor traps more heat, thus accelerating global warming. There's a number of other feedback effects, but you get the idea. They are all very bad. So why haven't we done anything yet? In the 1980s, there were actually solar panels on the White House and conservatives like the UK Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher were giving long talks to the United Nations about climate change. Now, I was still two days away from being born, so I can only speculate, but it probably seemed like people were actually going to do something about emissions. And that made the executives of some of the biggest companies in the world feel very threatened. Those working at companies like ExxonMobil and Shell knew that strong climate change policies could be catastrophic to their business, the business of selling oil. They knew climate change was real because they'd done their own research, and Shell even made a documentary about it, but they were worried about their own wealth more than the health of the planet. Exxon decided in the 1980s to, quote, emphasize the uncertainty in the scientific conclusions regarding the potential increased greenhouse effect. They paid to make bad science, they spent billions running climate change denial ad campaigns to confuse the public, and they even sponsored media companies like foxnews.com. Big Oil spent billions lobbying the US government to prevent climate action, mainly on Republicans who also often already have ties to the oil and gas industry. These companies influenced voters and our politicians not to take climate change seriously. When we did start taking it more seriously anyway, they offered a solution that they knew wouldn't be effective. In 2007, British Petroleum, now called BP, popularized the idea of the carbon footprint. Now, the climate emergency is not solvable through individual actions alone, and I've covered that elsewhere. What we need is political action and systemic solutions, but by deflecting the blame to the consumer level, Big Oil knew that they could dodge government intervention while paralyzing the public with guilt. That type of strategy is sometimes called cruel optimism. And Big Oil's latest strategy is to pander to what David Cluche calls our naive technological optimism by promoting the myth that technologies like carbon capture will save us. So we can continue with business as usual, despite the fact that these oil-funded facilities emit more CO2 than they cap. So uh, editing Curtis here. It's been a while since I filmed this and I'm gonna jump in a few times through this video uh, and sort of add some more detail. Something I didn't know when I filmed this is that carbon capture and storage uh, has the potential to be extremely dangerous um, because you have to transport carbon dioxide pressurized uh, through pipelines and Already we've had one pipeline in 2020 that uh, ruptured and spread a bunch of CO2 into Mississippi and caused dozens of people to get, get quite sick. So um, it's not just that this technology is unproven, it's also that you know it creates an entirely new environmental problem, um, which we have not yet figured out at all. So I wanna add also that uh, while we don't have carbon capture technology that works yet, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't keep researching it. I do think that we should continue to develop that uh, technology, but we can't 
stake our future on unproven technology. That just doesn't make any sense. Okay. Oil companies also say they're somehow going green even though their spending proves that's a lie. The lies go on and on, but big oil keeps putting profit before the planet. And so though I was born in 1989, just days after that Margaret Thatcher speech, most of the carbon emissions that have ever happened have happened in my lifetime. One thing that we know for sure is that change is inevitable. What type of change we get is up to us. Either we ignore science, do nothing, and make larger portions of the planet uninhabitable, or we radically reshape our societies to curb emissions and secure a livable planet. The best choice here is obvious, but seeing as we've been choosing unchecked climate change for decades, I'm going to take a moment to lay out both options. Content warning, this next section is frankly terrifying, but I do think it's important to understand the stakes, which is why this section is in the video. But if you're already on team, I'll do absolutely anything to stop this, then you can skip to part two of this video. Okay, so here's what our best climate models say will happen if we choose to continue to do nothing. Extreme heat waves in many countries around the world will become hot enough to melt asphalt, as they already have in India. Summer heat waves have already become lethal in places like Russia, India, and here in Canada. And the heat will get more extreme. That heat will also be lethal for many livestock and for pollinators too, while simultaneously climate change will increase crop pests in certain regions. Combined with increased drought, and we're looking at massive crop failures and food shortages. And the food we do make will be less nutritious as CO2 levels change how plants grow. The oceans will become warmer and more acidic, which will decimate the fish populations that billions currently rely on for food. When you consider all of that together, what we're potentially looking at is mass starvation. And there's more. As the glaciers and lakes that we rely on melt or dry up, billions could end up without water to drink. American forest fires have already gotten four times bigger in the last 20 years, and they'll continue to get worse. Rising sea levels, more extreme rainfall, and more intense tropical cyclones spell increased flooding, leading to over a billion people either dying or being displaced by climate disasters by the year 2050. And that's people alive today. The great injustice of environmental racism is that the people and the countries that have contributed the least to climate change are the ones that are the most affected by it. India is one of the countries that's been hit the hardest by the climate crisis, despite the fact that the average Indian produces 12 times fewer emissions than the average American. Climate change also disproportionately affects poorer neighborhoods, often neighborhoods with more people of color. We saw this with disasters such as Hurricane Katrina, but no one is safe from climate change. Carbon dioxide is what makes air feel stale. Higher CO2 levels will impair every single person's ability to think, possibly dropping human cognition by about 10 to 16% by the end of the century. I did a video demonstrating that in my airtight greenhouse. As animals like bats and pangolins are further pushed towards extinction by habitat loss, they breed more diseases and more frequently come into contact with humans, causing more frequent deadly pandemics in the future. In addition to mass death, COVID-19 also hugely disrupted our supply chains, but with unchecked climate change, we're looking at much more severe supply chain breakdown. With more extreme weather events wiping out roads and making air and ocean travel unsafe, materials and goods will not get to where they need to go. Our modern infrastructure will be under constant bombardment from increased storms. Our power grids are already experiencing an increase in outages because of this. Add to the fact that we'll be spending more of our time and energy just on survival, on shelter, food, and water, 
and on fighting off the future pandemics. And it's clear that doing nothing is infinitely the more expensive option. Climate change is predicted to cost $2 trillion to the American economy each year by the end of the century, unless we act now. And after all of that, if we survive, we will eventually still run out of fossil fuels and we'll still have to make the transition to renewables, but we'll be stuck with a changed climate. Carbon dioxide sticks around in the air for centuries. So however bad we let this get, it will stay that bad for generations. So this option is, in a word, apocalyptic. It's global ecosystem collapse and mass extinction. This is the direction that we are currently headed in. I know that that might sound hyperbolic, and to that I say my sources are in the description. And it also might feel like governments are taking action on climate, right? After all, 70 countries have set targets to get to net zero emissions by the year 2050. And that's a step in the right direction, but there are three major issues with this. First, to be clear, these are targets, not plans. And a destination without a roadmap is a sure way to get lost. That's why despite these targets, we are still subsidizing and expanding fossil fuels more than climate adaptations and mitigations. Secondly, a 30-year timeline is way outside of the reach of achieving in a two-term presidency, and any unfinished work by the current administration could get trashed by the next incoming conservative leader. Lastly, we're not even talking about zero emissions. We're talking about net zero, which is to say we'll still be emitting in the year 2050, but these targets are counting on carbon capture technologies for negative emissions, despite that this technology does not yet exist. So no, we're not doing enough, not even close. But the good news is that the future is uncertain. We can stop climate change from getting worse. We can make rapid and radical changes this decade. We can rapidly stop using fossil fuels, transition to renewables, and adapt to the warming we've already committed ourselves to. We can create a future where our cities are less polluted and where fewer people die from respiratory illnesses and where, for once, everyone can thrive. Yes, the best time to act on climate change was decades ago, but it's still not too late to prevent the worst of climate catastrophes. The longer that we wait, the faster that we'll have to curb our emissions and the harder it will be to do the work as climate disasters will demand more of our attention. Now, whether we act or continue on course with business as usual, this is a choice that we are making. And so far, we've been choosing climate change. I did my master's studying renewable energy, and in the decades since then, I've had many moments where I've realized an entirely new dimension to the issue of climate change. And sort of like peeling through the layers of an onion, just when I think I understand the problem, I find another layer. After all, climate change is challenging because we've built our entire modern civilization around using fossil fuels. So getting rid of that requires completely rethinking and rebuilding our society. Our incremental attempts to halt emissions have so far been futile, as noted by our still accelerating rate of carbon emissions. We tried free market solutions for the last 30 plus years, and we're even worse off than when we started. We're not going to solve this issue just by switching to electric cars and planting some trees. So let's go through these issues and their solutions one layer at a time. I've already talked about how your carbon footprint is a scam and it's really not deserving enough to even be called a layer of our climate onion. It's much more like the sticker but I will share a few very quick tips on how to shrink your carbon footprint, if for no other reason than your peace of mind. Here goes. Fly less, 
Swap your truck for a cargo bike and your car for public transit. If there isn't any in your suburb, move into an apartment in a city that has it. Stop buying stuff you don't need. Stop eating meat. If you own a home, make sure it's well insulated. Get off of gas by switching to a heat pump and an induction cooktop and turn your lawn into a native habitat or a food garden. If you're particularly wealthy, one of the biggest things you can do is to divest your investments away from fossil fuels. But again, we don't need more consumer-based solutions. We need an energy revolution. 61% of the electricity in America is currently made by burning fossil fuels. We need to get that number to zero by monumentally increasing our production of wind, solar, geothermal, and nuclear power. The carbon footprint of ethanol biofuel made from corn is actually worse than that of gasoline. And with the way most hydrogen is currently produced, it can also be worse than coal or natural gas. These are maladaptations to climate change, things that sound good, but actually help perpetuate our use of oil and gas. We just need to stop burning things for energy. This isn't the stone age. And thankfully, renewable energy is affordable. Solar is now actually the cheapest way for most countries to generate their electricity. Without fuel, everything must go electric. We need to upgrade our homes with electric water heaters and heat pumps and induction cooktops. Our transportation and our industries also need to make the change. In many cases, we can simply swap out oil and gas technologies for electric versions that already exist. But in other cases, we'll need to change what and how we produce things. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Switching everything to renewable electricity also presents a great challenge for our energy supply and demand. For example, solar panels produce energy only when the sun is out. And we can't simply build a big electric battery to store all of it for nighttime use. The biggest battery on the planet can power a million homes for half an hour. So we need decentralized storage solutions like vehicle to grid, which would allow for electric vehicles to give back energy to the grid. And we need smart packetized energy, wherein devices like electric water heaters can be programmed to prioritize energy use when there is a surplus and to use less when there's a shortage. All of this together means that we'll need to massively retool the electricity grid, which is currently already struggling to keep up. In addition to powering everything with renewable electricity, we'll need to use less energy. And that means centering efficiency in how we design everything. One example of this is to end the continued sprawl of suburbs in favor of denser cities. This entire neighborhood houses about the same number of people as this one apartment building. Being spread out like this has many energy disadvantages. With more overall exterior walls, suburbs take more energy to heat and cool than apartments, for the same reason that a bunch of separate ice cubes melt faster than one big one. That's one of the reasons that a typical detached house uses twice as much energy as a typical apartment. But perhaps even more importantly, the sprawl of suburbs forces us to rely on cars and all the infrastructure baggage that comes along with them. More densely populated cities are more bikeable and more walkable, and that saves energy, and it makes people healthier and happier. We can also improve housing insulation and build in ways that let sunlight inside in the winter and keep us shaded in the summer. We'll also have to change how we grow food, including changing the machinery we use, weaning ourselves off of the energy intensive fertilizers we use, and change what we choose to grow. Right now, a lot of the food we grow is used to feed animals, while just half of the calories we grow actually get eaten by humans. We can massively reduce our energy use by reducing the amount of meat we consume. One step we can take is to stop sending billions of dollars of subsidies to animal agriculture. And there's more we can do. Here in Canada, most of the food that gets grown in the country gets wasted, and that means wasted energy. We can enact policies and create government programs that help feed more people while simultaneously reducing food waste. The biggest emission reduction that we can make with zero lifestyle cost is to demilitarize. 
the American military has a bigger carbon footprint than the country Sweden. Essentially, we could take nuclear disarmament one step further and work towards ratcheting down militaries around the world. We can also put an end, by law, to super yachts, private jets, and many of the gas-guzzling luxuries that only benefit the most elite of our societies. And everyone in the global north will need to learn to consume less and to take better care of the things we have. It's neither sustainable nor remotely necessary for us to be producing 14 items of clothing for everyone on the planet each year. By pumping the brakes on consumer culture industries like fast fashion, we can save tons of energy. We can reduce industries of material extraction and production while investing more in service and knowledge-based economies. And we also need to reconsider our relationship to the economy. Our society is fixated on growing the economy even when it is self-sacrificing, and even if endless economic growth on a planet with finite resources is physically not sustainable. But we don't actually need growth to improve society. In fact, Gross domestic product, or GDP, does not reflect the change in well-being of the vast majority of people. Rather, GDP is an aggregate that hides inequality. While American GDP has risen steadily over the last 60 years, adjusted for inflation, the richest American today is about 30 times wealthier than the richest American was 60 years ago. While over that same time, minimum wage has fallen by 37% adjusted for inflation. America has healthy GDP growth alongside growing inequality. Things like breastfeeding, Wikipedia, and even this nonprofit and free to watch video are all products and services that do not contribute to economic growth. In fact, you could argue that they hurt the economy due to potential sales losses in things like baby formulas and encyclopedias. Meanwhile, the military-industrial complex, the tobacco industry, and yes, the fossil fuel industry all contribute to the economy at great costs to human life. This is what David Pilling calls perverse accounting, where we value precisely the opposite of what is actually beneficial. Unrestrained capitalism has mostly benefited a small, wealthy minority at great cost to the health of the majority. And in the process, it's put the fate of the world at risk. Capitalism got us here, and capitalism is not going to get us out. What we need is economic degrowth. If over one third of Brits believe that their job doesn't meaningfully contribute to the world, then maybe we need to do those jobs less. In 2019, researchers found that switching to a four-day work week could reduce British carbon emissions by 20% in just five years, which is to say nothing of the fact that working less reduces stress and makes people happier. Speaking of cutting back on work, by eliminating the fossil fuel industry, we'll also be eliminating the 300,000 American jobs in the fossil fuel industry. We don't want to leave those people behind, and we don't have to. A green transition would create more than twice as many jobs than we'd lose with oil and gas. That's new jobs building solar panels and mass transit, and we need to help train those people for free for those jobs. Unfortunately, though, our society is already leaving people behind, and the reality is we can't make meaningful change on climate without making meaningful change on social justice. These two issues are intrinsically interlinked. In her book, Becoming Abolitionists, Dereka Purnell dives into how climate change will persist as long as we have systems of oppression that divert the worst of climate disasters onto marginalized communities and onto people of color. We need to dismantle these systems, including the prison industrial complex, and we need to equitably distribute the costs and benefits of climate action. That means rich people pay more and those who need more help get it. By taxing the super rich, we can help to pay for much of the change that we need. An extremely modest 3% total annual tax on billionaires' wealth would raise trillions of dollars in the US. Besides, 
we actually can't have a billionaire class and also have a habitable planet. It's Jeff's $500 million super yacht and its support yacht or a livable future, but we can't have both. We can also help transition everyone to a greener future by making higher education free, like any of these countries already do, and by providing everyone with enough money so that they can meet their basic needs, like we did during the pandemic, but more and forever. Despite what you might expect, economists have shown that such a universal basic income, or a UBI, would not make people work less. Not that that would even be a bad thing. Universal basic income studies show improvements to education, mental and physical health, decreases in addiction and crime, and it makes people happier, less stressed, and increases trust in public institutions. All of those benefits result in a UBI actually saving money for the economy overall. Lastly, the countries that contributed the least to climate change are the ones that are suffering the most and they need justice. We need to talk about climate reparations, that is, financially helping these countries, and we need to talk about opening our borders to climate migrants, to all of those who are forced from their homes due to, in large part, our unrestrained use of fuel. At the very core of our rotten climate onion is the very fact that climate change is an intersectional issue, which is to say it is tightly tied to many of the biggest issues that humans face. I think when I first fully realized this, it was when I was involved in an ongoing group protest against the construction of an oil pipeline. And one of these intersectional issues blew our group apart. It's an all too familiar story. An old white man in a position of power in our group was making repeated unwanted advances on a woman in our group. This made many people deeply uncomfortable, while many of the mostly older members of the group didn't think it was that big of a deal. It got so bad that after five months of vigilance on our part, when the construction crews finally came to build the oil pipeline on the site that we've been trying to protect, none of us were actually there to do anything about it. Patriarchy killed our ability to work together to fight for climate action, and that broke me, literally. It was the singular depressing and stressful event that on top of the pandemic isolation and on top of climate anxiety led to a dormant disease in my intestines to flare up to the point where I needed surgery. It physically changed my life. It was that event that made me realize the full scope of how power, masculinity, and oil are all tied together. We've somehow tied being a man to burning fossil fuels. The, the culture of American men is one of trucks, lawn mowing, and NASCAR, and as such, men not only have higher emissions than women, but they're less likely to join a climate protest or to see climate as a major threat. Our modern societies currently run on oil and gas, and our societies run much to the benefit of the mostly white men that dominate them. Fossil fuels are both literally and figuratively about power. The CEOs of oil and gas companies are some of the wealthiest men on the planet. And they are men, like literally 99% of them. These companies are deeply aggressive, exploitative, and colonialist. To this day, foreign oil corporations are causing deadly oil spills in developing nations and ramming dangerous pipelines through indigenous territories in developed countries without their consent. I've come to realize that part of solving climate change means solving all of this. We need to decouple masculine from fuel and from power. We need to get more women into positions of power and we need to shrink the gender pay gap. American women only earned 84% of what men earned in 2020. And we need to shrink the gender gap that we see in leadership roles in governments and in corporations. Women make up only 7% of government leaders, yet we've seen that having more female representation in parliament leads to more progressive climate policies being implemented. We also need to decolonize. We need to respect indigenous rights and fully include indigenous nations in climate policy decision-making. 
All of this is essential in preventing the renewable revolution from playing out in the same sorts of racist and sexist ways that the oil and gas industry has for over a century. When scientists discovered that smoking causes cancer, we regulated the tobacco industry so that they could no longer sell cigarettes to children. We are now in a place where we know that the fossil fuel industry is endangering the entire planet, and we need strong governments to stop them. We need to break up monopolies, strengthen our governments and our public institutions, and nationalize certain industries. During both the world wars, US presidents nationalized many American industries. Our governments have the power to nationalize the fossil fuel industry in order to prevent it from further expanding its operations, and instead to force it to transition into renewables on a timeline that is compatible with a livable future. We need to make it harder for corporations and money to influence politics and easier for people to have their voices heard. America already has antitrust laws on the books that they can use to break up mega conglomerate corporations, which would help to reduce the power that companies have over our government. We could enact laws to reduce corporate lobbying. We could work to end gerrymandering we can rein in voter suppression and put spending limits and corporate donation limits on political campaigns which make it nearly impossible for anyone but the wealthiest and most well-connected of society to get elected. We can enact political reforms such as proportional representation in Canada and follow countries like Belgium in lowering the age restriction on voting so the generation most affected by climate change can actually cast a vote. And a functioning democracy requires a strong, free press and healthy education systems, and currently ours are failing. We can publicly fund them and fix them. There is so much we can do. Lastly, climate disasters are here already, and we need to adapt. At an individual level, we need to pack our own go bags and have an emergency plan for if there's a fire or a flood. But at a systemic level, we'll need to build physical infrastructure like the seawall built to protect Venice against major flooding events. And we'll need to prepare more for emergency response, like pop-up cooling stations for people to shelter in during deadly heat waves. As climate disasters wreak further havoc on people's health, access to free healthcare is a climate adaptation strategy that we need. Climate change is already posing a mental health crisis, and we need scalable solutions like group therapy to solve that. As housing is already out of the reach for many, becoming increasingly so for others, and as climate disasters are predicted to destroy 167 million homes in the next 20 years, we need to recognize housing as a basic human right and act on it. Affordable housing is a climate adaptation and changing zoning regulations to allow for denser housing can help. If that monumental to-do list made it feel like the climate challenge is too overwhelming, then let me stop you before that sense of it's pointless to even try doomerism burrows into your brain. Climate change is terrifying and it's hard. It's the biggest threat our species has ever faced. And once you turn knowledge about climate change into realization, it can feel impossible to think about anything else. It can feel paralyzing, especially since many of the problem-solving skills that we learn in capitalist societies are utterly useless against it. When the scale of the environmental crisis really clicked with me, I instinctively looked to my consumer choices. I wanted to go zero waste, I wanted an electric car and a passive solar house with my own garden, and all of that was frankly really out of touch because most of that is simply not affordable to most people. Now this might sound a little too chicken soup for the soul, but I should have started by looking inwards. I needed to do what the author Britt Ray calls internal activism. I needed to do the emotional work of coming to terms with the climate change that is already here and accepting that my future will be more of a struggle than the one that I was promised. I also needed to do the internal work of deprogramming colonialism, capitalism, and the patriarchy, and the work of building a mental framework that is more 
anti-racist, and that centers social equitability. For example, buying a car is not an affordable option for most people, and solutions to climate change need to apply to everyone, like fighting for good, affordable public transit. A lot of the internal work is emotional. Many of us are stuck in the first stage of grief around climate. Denial. Our survival tactics are saying, if we pretend we don't see it, maybe it will go away, but this isn't going away. For a while, I was stuck in the bargaining phase, thinking that if I could just buy the right eco-friendly things, then in some way I could escape climate guilt. Others are stuck in anger or in depression, and this is intense, and those are valid emotional responses. This is not a just situation, and many people suffer moral injury because of it. Anger and sadness are neither good nor bad emotions. They just are. These feelings evolved because they are survival strategies. Adrenaline gave us the energy to fight off that attacking saber-toothed tiger, but we didn't evolve to spend long periods of time in heightened states of stress. It's not healthy. It certainly wasn't for me. You can't take care of the climate if you don't take care of yourself and your mental health. I didn't do that, and it put me in the hospital. I couldn't contribute to the movement for over a year. So find someone to talk to, meditate, run to relieve stress. Find time to process all of this. Find what works for you. I'll leave resources in the description. I've learned that living with climate change is a lot like living with an incurable chronic illness. It sucks. And no matter what you do, it's never going to go away entirely. Hoping for a cure gets you nowhere. But you can learn to live with it. You can find treatments and diets or take actions that reduce the symptoms. There will, at times, be suffering but you can still live a meaningful life. And that is the final stage of grief, acceptance. By that, I don't mean accepting that climate change is coming and there is nothing we can do about it, so we may as well lay down and die. I mean accepting that climate change is now a part of our lives and we have to plan our lives accordingly. We have to adapt and mitigate. Since I stopped thinking about climate change in terms of hope, I have felt much more able to function and to do the work that needs doing. I fight for our climate because it's the right thing to do, not because I'm hoping for or expecting a specific outcome. And I really think that that is a much more resilient perspective. Climate action gives me purpose, while hope can run out. Regardless of the outcome, I want to be able to look back and know that my life honored those who have already lost their lives in climate disasters. I want to live my life in line with my values, and I want to be able to tell my now two-year-old niece that I did everything I could to secure her generation's future. I also think that in a world where less and less seems to make sense, having a clear sense of purpose for good, makes everything feel a little bit better. And finally, this brings us all the way back to that question that I was asked back in 2018, which is, what can you and I actually do about climate change? And the answer is, it depends. And okay, before you start typing out your angry comment, just hear me out. It depends on who you are, on what your interests, abilities, and personal privileges are, as well as what your local community needs. There are a lot of different approaches, and finding yours is a bit of a personal journey. No one approach is perfect, but we need a lot of people working together on all the angles. As I've stressed throughout this video, we need system change. That is, we need strong governmental action on climate. For people living in democratic countries, we need to vote and campaign for politicians who put climate action at the center of their ideology. That means climate-aware politicians who talk about ending fossil fuels as soon as possible, who understand the intersectionality of climate, wealth, race, and social justice, 
It means politicians who signed the pledge promising not to take money from fossil fuel companies. We cannot continue to cast votes for parties like the Canadian Conservatives who officially do not recognize that climate change is even real. If you're still not sure who to support, there's third party organizations like Lead Now who give climate ratings to political candidates. I'll leave links in the description. And voting is literally the least you can do to help a climate leader get elected. Political campaigns need volunteers with all sorts of skills for all sorts of positions such as these, and they need donations too. Between municipal, state, and federal elections, there's pretty much always a campaign happening near you at any time that you can get involved in, so you don't have to wait. And anyone can help. You can start today by Googling what elections are happening soon near you, figuring out what campaigns you might like to get involved with, and then just reaching out to them through their website or their socials. Future me again, uh, I just wanna stress the fact that elections are a necessary starting point, um, but they're not enough on their own. And in part, that's because people tend to say that they care about climate change, but when they actually get to the ballot box, they often forget that concern. And I think part of the reason for that is that the mainstream media is just not giving adequate coverage to the topic. And we need to change that. And, and we can by doing things like mass protests, we can get climate change on the news and get it on people's minds. And even when people want to vote for climate change, their votes often don't count because of issues like gerrymandering and voter suppression. And even when we do get someone elected, we can't be sure that they're not just going to forget about their campaign promises, as they often do. I'm looking at you, Justin Trudeau, saying that, that we were going to have no more elections with the first past the post in 2015. Anyway, we have to hold these politicians accountable, and we can do that through protesting. Now, at the risk of sounding too repetitive, global emissions are continuing to rise annually. What we've been doing to stop that has been insufficient. We need to try everything that we can, because this is really important, and we need to be trying things that are radically different. When you look through history at movements like the like women's suffrage or the civil rights movement, those things didn't just happen in a electoral ballot box vacuum. They happened because millions of people raised their voices and marched to the streets. We need mass protests and general strikes for movements like this, like climate change, to succeed. We need to be able to get this issue on people's minds and we need to be able to pressure politicians. And that's why democratic freedoms are not just about voting, it's also the right to protest. Nonviolent civil disobedience groups like the Sunrise Movement, Extinction Rebellion, and Fridays for Future, among others, need people to help organize and train volunteers, to plan events, to make banners, to get out the word, just to name a few tasks. You can organize at the company you work for or at the university you attend. Students and staff across Canada have already succeeded in getting over a dozen universities to divest their assets from fossil fuels. These campaigns are most likely to be effective when they focus on specific and actionable goals for the company or university. In the face of climate chaos, protesting is not a radical act, it's a rational one. When the COVID-19 pandemic happened, we completely changed how our societies operated and we spent trillions of dollars on the issue. Climate change is a much bigger crisis and we need to fight for a proportionally bigger response. There are nearly 2,000 climate action lawsuits that are either completed or still ongoing, whether it's cases against oil and gas pipelines like Keystone XL and the Trans Mountain Expansion, or class action lawsuits from teenagers or lawsuits against big oil for lying to the public about climate change. These cases matter. They can slow down the construction process for pipelines. They help to shift public awareness and perception of the problem. And most of all, they can win, like last year when a Dutch court ruled that Shell must reduce its greenhouse gas emissions by 45% by the year 2030. While this climate action 
isn't something that everyone can get involved in that easily. It is an important part of the work being done. Every country, including the US, needs an environmental court, which has judges that are already educated in environmental laws and agencies that do not presume that the government can do no wrong. And that is something that any citizen can organize and fight for. In the months since I filmed this, the US Supreme Court has rolled back constitutional rights to abortion and preemptively curbed the Environmental Protection Agency's ability to regulate carbon emissions. Uh, and myself, along with a lot of people, are quite concerned that we're witnessing the very start of a bunch of rollbacks to constitutional rights, um, to basic human rights. And uh, yeah, it's a big concern. If you want to stay up to date on what's going on, I really recommend the podcast Five to Four. It's about why the Supreme Court sucks uh, and it's really, really well done. And I also hope that you'll check out demandjustice.org to see how you can get involved in actually helping to fix the Supreme Court by doing things like getting them to add more justices, add more seats. Um, yeah. That's it from me. I've put a list of organizations and their websites in the video description that you can contact today to get involved with. And you don't just have to volunteer your time either. You can find a career that helps to combat the climate crisis. You can build windmills, become a politician, repair bicycles, work in education, work for a non-for-profit. Hopefully by now you understand that there are so many paths to fighting for climate action that there is definitely a place for you in that fight. Ultimately, to solve climate change, we need to get more people to fight for climate action. Research suggests that it might take just as little as activating 3.5% of the general public to get a social movement to succeed. That's not that much, that's very doable. But to do it, we need to be talking more about climate. Most Americans say they rarely or never discuss global warming with their friends and family. If we want to halt emissions, we need to change that. Especially considering that people that hear about climate change several times a year are more likely to support strong climate policies. We have to stop pretending that this isn't happening. We need to stop gaslighting each other and ourselves. This is a big deal. These conversations aren't always easy to have, so here are some tips. First, take a moment to think about who you'll be engaging with before you get started. Really listen to people and ask them questions without attacking them and try to meet them wherever they are. Figure out what they care about and what would make them care about climate change. Remember that the goal in these conversations should be to get everyone to shift just a little more towards helping the climate. Sometimes that means inviting someone to go to a climate march with you, but other times it'll mean trying to convince someone that maybe it's a bad idea to unthinkingly spread big oil propaganda on Facebook. <laughs> Whoever they are, approach them with compassion and try to engage with them about how they feel about these things, because we often let our opinions on matters of fact get tied up in our emotions. Know that a lot of people feel a lot of guilt and they can feel under attack, especially when their jobs are heavily reliant on fossil fuels. It's often worth getting into what a just transition could be like in the conversation, as early in the conversation as possible, so that people understand that environmentalists aren't out to get them. Also know that it's sometimes not worth engaging at all. There are a lot of people that are determined to never change their minds when shown new information or new perspectives, despite the fact that that is literally what learning is. There are a lot of trolls out there too, especially online, I know, and these conversations just aren't worth your time or frustration, so please don't feed the trolls. But most of the time, and with most people, it's worth it, and we need to try. Yes, it takes practice, but we just have to start having more of these conversations. This is by far my densest and longest video ever, and uh, I know that it doesn't make for easily shareable water cooler chatter content, but I do hope that it can help spark some meaningful conversation, so please consider sharing it if you can. And again, the video description has resources and sources and links to everything that I've covered. 
and thank you for watching.